right, today is all going to be about um, narrative theories and it's important to point out that when we uh, look at narratives there's a lot of different theories out there there are narrative theories that are all to do with the types of character so the heroes, the villains and that's prop, we'll cover that later there's also narrative theories that are all to do with uh, different types of conflict so old versus young or good versus evil um, that again, binary opposition theory, that's a different narrative theory today we're going to look at Todorov's narrative theory. Now, when we look at narrative theories, when we're creating stories, when we're making them ourselves, we don't necessarily um, use these theories. So if someone's writing a story, they don't sort of look in the textbook and say, oh, look, I've, I've missed out the villain, or I've missed out this, this particular thing. That's not how it works. These theories, they are really about being able to analyse a story. So they're a tool for us as uh, media students or film study students to be able to look at a story and try and identify those key components. And what a narrative is, is it's essentially it's, it's the structure of telling a story. And going right back to the olden days, as long as storytelling has been a thing, no one's ever just said, um, yeah, this bloke will, you know, beat this bad guy and that was it. There's always that building up of a story and trying to make it engaging and that, that's what a narrative is. Okay, so Todorov. Now, basically you're not going to be asked um, particular questions on this in an exam or anything like that. You don't need to necessarily remember all these different bits. What you're likely to be asked is based on a film or based on a media product that you've already looked at, how could you apply Todorov's theory to it? And so you need to understand which one of those narrative theories is Todorov's. And an easy way to remember that is Todorov is all about the events. It's about the sequence of events that happen in a narrative. So it's not about the characters, it's about the things that are happening. And it's kind of like a checklist of things that a story will go through. So all stories will have a beginning, a middle, an end, um, and Todorov's theory, which I'll go into in a second, is like a checklist of events. So if you see the word Todorov in an exam, take away the Rov, you're left with to do. Okay? And so if you see to do, then you know that it's asking you about that checklist, that to-do list of events that are going to happen. Okay, so let's get into the theory. Let's, let's actually look at this and apply it to some things. The first one is equilibrium. And equilibrium basically means calm and peaceful. And what it's really referring to is, as an audience, we need to know why our characters care um, or why they're trying to fix the world. We need to see the world before it breaks to be able to appreciate the journey that they're on. So most stories start off with a state of equilibrium and this is what the world looks like for our characters at the beginning of a story. Um, a great example would be Legally Blonde. And in Legally Blonde we see this sort of pretty and pink Barbie-esque kind of lifestyle where everyone's happy and caring and our character is happy. And uh, this is emphasised by the soundtrack in the background, Perfect Day. So take the Matrix for example, in Neo's Equilibrium, um, we see our character, John Anderson, it, at work, being told off by his boss, and um, you know it's being emphasised how dull and lifeless it is, but it's still a state of equilibrium, because essentially there's nothing really wrong happening at the moment, that's what his world normally looks like. 
ourselves with this. Then comes the disruption. And the disruption is normally the event that starts our narrative into motion. It's the, it's the, the thing, it's the problem that our heroes, our characters, our, um, the whole narrative is going to try and solve this problem. So the disruption in Legally Blonde comes when she's expecting to be proposed to and um, that doesn't happen and she ends up breaking up with her boyfriend and it completely uh, tears her world apart. One of the reasons I wanted to come here tonight was to discuss our future. And I am fully amenable to that discussion. Good. Well, you know how we've been having all kinds of fun lately? Yeah. Well, Harvard is going to be different. Law school is a, a completely different world, eh? And I need to be serious. Of course. I mean, my family expects a lot from me. Right. I expect a lot from mm -hmm. me. I plan on running for office someday. And I fully support that warning. You know that, right? Absolutely. But the thing is, if I'm going to be a senator by the time I'm 30, I need to stop digging around. Oh, Warner, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I think it's time for us. L. Pooh Bear. Yes. I think I we do. should break up. I've been thinking about it, and I think it's the right thing to do. Another example, um, in The Matrix, the disruption happens when Neo starts to realise that something's not right. So it's when he's first introduced to the concept that he is in danger and that the world isn't as it seems. So the disruption actually occurs in this scene where we see the agents coming to get Neo. Okay, if we take this scene from Star Wars, this is actually the opening scene. And in this scene, it is the disruption. Princess Leia gets captured and um, she sends out a message to the hero to come and rescue her. Now that's the opening scene. But that doesn't mean that Star Wars doesn't have an equilibrium. Because if we go back, we can then see Luke's equilibrium. We see Luke on Tatooine, um, buying his droids and just generally a normal lifestyle. Now those things have happened slightly out of order because we're seeing the equilibrium after we've already seen the disruption. But that's just, um, that's just interesting directing and storytelling. And it doesn't change the fact that these to-dos, this checklist of narrative is still in there. It's just in a slightly different order. Um, and some filmmakers will try to do that. They'll try to ch change the order of events to keep things interesting. Um, memento is a really good example of telling a story out of sequence to try and keep the audience on the toes. Um, but nevertheless, so far we've got equilibrium and then we've got disruption. And Star Wars, as a bit of a niche example, has flipped those around. There is another step. So the next step is the recognition of that disruption. So until our heroes, until our characters recognise that that disruption's happened, it's still not a story. For example, um, if, uh, if something happens, a volcano erupts in New Zealand, and I'm the hero of the story, but I don't know it's happened, there's still no story. It doesn't make any difference. It's only once the characters recognise that disruption's happened that we then start to uh, get the story. So the recognition for Legally Blonde is when the character, Elle, realises that in order to fix her disruption, she wants to become, um, she wants to be seen as a more intelligent person. She wants to go to uh, law school. And that's when she has this epiphany moment. Have a look at it here. Yale Law. <gasps> this is the type of girl that Warner wants to marry. This is what I need to become to be serious. What? Practically deformed? No. A law student. Okay, another recognition then is when Neo finally sees the real world. So he gets given um, the option, he chooses the tablet, and he then basically um, wakes up and he sees the world as it really is. And up until that moment, as Morpheus literally says, 
I can't tell you what the disruption is. You have to see it for yourself. You have to recognise it for yourself. And he wakes up and he sees all of the, um, the pods and the people and he, he recognises what the problem is that he needs to fix. Okay. Um, so let's have a look at some other examples then and see if you can spot them for yourself. So here's some other examples of those narratives where the recognition is occurring. What you are, my little friend, and where you come from. I saw part of the message. He w I seem to have found it. General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. I regret that I am unable to present my father's request to you in person, but my ship has fallen under attack and I'm afraid my mission to bring you to Alderaan has failed. Okay, the next bit then is the attempt to repair that disruption and this is normally the bulk of the story this is normally the what most of the film most of the tv series most of the video game it is what most of the media text is spent trying to do we see our heroes attempting to repair now they recognize what's wrong they're going off and they're trying to fix it and um, for and normally although this is the bulk of the scene we normally see elements of sort of training montage or our hero learning skills or our hero um, test attempt to repair if we have a look in legally blonde this is where she actually goes to law school she realizes things aren't quite working out and so she has to actually study really learn really work hard and, and put some effort in and her self-belief and all of those things and she's becoming a lawyer well, yeah but i mean without this man's sperm the child in question wouldn't exist. Now you're thinking like a lawyer. Yes, Ms. Woods. Although Mr. Huntington makes an excellent point, I have to wonder if the defendant kept a thorough record of every sperm emission made throughout his life. <laughs> Interesting. Why do you ask? Well, Unless the defendant attempted to contact every single one-night stand to determine if a child resulted in those unions, he has no parental claim over this child whatsoever. Why now? Why this sperm? I see your point. Other attempts to repair then, we've got Luke training to become a Jedi so that he can overcome Darth Vader. We've got Neo training in the Matrix learning the skills so that he can go back into the machine and try and rescue all of those innocent people. Let's have a look then at some other attempts to repair and let's just have a quick look at those. Remember, a Jedi can feel the Force flowing through him. You mean it controls your actions? Partially. But it also obeys your commands. <laughs> okay. So, so far, we've got equilibrium, what the world looks like, disruption, that moment of um, problem, recognition, where the characters realise there's a problem, and attempt to repair most of the story, where they are trying to fix the problem. And that leads us to the final stage of this narrative theory, and that is the new equilibrium. So this is when the hero um, overcomes the villain or when the problem gets fixed or sometimes it's a brand new state of equilibrium. It doesn't always return to how things were. Sometimes it's a new state of equilibrium. Take Legally Blonde again. Her attempt to repair the disruption was her trying to win her boyfriend back. It was her trying to be seen as a respectable person for the sake of um, retaining her relationship. However, her new equilibrium doesn't work like that. She doesn't get the boyfriend back. What she gets is, is self-respect and what she gets is the realisation that she's, she's not that bothered about that kind of person. Um, and so the new equilibrium in Legally Blonde is that epic moment when her ex-boyfriend asks her back out and she basically says, no thanks. Let's have a look. Help, help, help. I just want to say that you were so brilliant in there and that I was wrong. And you are the girl for me. Really? Yes. Who bear? I love you. Oh, Warner. 
I've waited so long to hear you say that. But if I'm going to be a partner in a law firm by the time I'm 30, I need a boyfriend who's not such a complete bonehead. Finish him! So the new equilibrium, essentially, in the Matrix, is where uh, Neo has developed his powers and gained his confidence, and he goes back into the Matrix and essentially sets out some new terms for the computer. And we, we're left seeing that things are going to change. We don't know what they are yet, and that's for the sequels, but essentially the new equilibrium is that um, the character of Neo is the one. In Star Wars, we have the moment where um, they defeat the villains, they blow up the Death Star, but we're, we're, what we get is Luke's new equilibrium, is that he's no longer on Tatooine, and he's no longer um, a scrapyard um, person who fixes robots and stuff. He's basically... Um, off to become a Jedi Knight and he's got a new purpose and a new role of his identity. So in these stories, the, equal, the, the new equilibrium, it's not always, in fact it's very rarely a return to how things were, but it's a new state of calm and it's a new way of things being positive and happy. Okay, so that is Todorov's theory. Remember, to do, it's a checklist of events that happen in a story and those events are everything's calm, equilibrium, something happens, disruption, characters realise something happened, recognition, they all try to repair it, attempt to repair, and then the new equilibrium, so the end of the story. Not always a happy ending, but a new equilibrium. Okay, for a really good example of how you can use this theory to analyse films and to come up with um, your own take on whether they're good or they're bad, I'm going to do another video. So you can click on a link that I'll put into this video where I analyse Justice League and we're going to explore why we think Justice League failed from a narrative point of view and we're going to use the Todorov theory to do that. So crack on, have a look at that video if you want as a bit of a go further extension task. See you next time.